Hi, I'm Ashton, and today I'm doing another trans-related book review. Last time I talked about Before I Had the Words, a book by Skylar Kurgle, um, and today I... Bear, honey. And today I will be talking about Parrotfish by Ellen Whitlingire. It's either Whitlingire or Whitlinger, I'm not sure. Um, or it could be like Wittlinger if it's German or something, I don't know. Um, anyways, by Ellen. Before I get started, of course, the little disclaimer that I am one trans person. I don't stand for every trans person on the planet. These are just my views on this book and what I thought of it and what I thought of some of the nuances that it kind of brought to light. And similar to my last book review, I wrote down some notes as I read the book, but this time it's more organized, so I have it in sections of kind of my intro, my review of the book from a book standpoint, and my review of the book from a trans standpoint, and then any miscellaneous things at the end, stuff like that. But the basics, this is a realistic fiction young adult novel. Although the book was published in 2007, it was actually written in 2005 with the help of Ellen Whitlinger's trans friend, um, which is definitely a good sign right off the bat. Ellen is cisgender, and I always get kind of wary when I'm reading a book about a trans person that was written by a cis person for obvious reasons, and it does come for me to know that a trans person was involved not only in the writing itself, but in the plot and the background. Before I get into the trans-related aspects of the book, I wanted to talk a little bit about the book as a whole, like writing style, any mistakes, things I noticed, the plot, and, you know, stuff that isn't trans-centric, just it's your standard book review. So, um, actually the first thing I wrote down in this section was that goth was capitalized. At one point in the book they were talking about, like, you know, subgroups, like subcultures in this high school, which is like, you know, normal high schools do have that. And they said goths and they capitalized it. So I was like, you know, as in like gothic people in like ancient times. Um, no, they meant like the subgroup goths, but they capitalized it as if it was a proper noun. And I was like, I've never seen that done. Because they were definitely talking about goth as like a subculture that branched off from punk in the 80s, but it was capitalized. So it confused me a bit. Um, and I don't know if that was a thing in 2007. I don't know. I just wrote that down. That's not important. I'm not good at being a book reviewer, um, but it's something I noticed and it's something that threw me off a bit. One of the things that the main character Grady enjoys is kind of screenwriting, screenplays, TV, movie, you know, play, production, stuff like that. And that matched really well with the style of the writing when the author put in kind of screenplay type things. It made a lot of sense with the main character wanting to be a screenwriter, but it did sometimes disrupt the flow of the story, and it also annoyed me that it wasn't in proper screenplay format, like at all. The font wasn't right, the way that you do, like, character dialogue wasn't right, parentheticals were used incorrectly, it just wasn't written like a proper screenplay. Um, and you'd think that a sophomore in high school, which Grady is, um, would know how to do that. Of course, I know artistic liberties, but at first I didn't really pick up that it was supposed to appear like a screenplay because it's not what a screenplay looks like. Let me show you. Here's an example of what one of the screenplays looked like right here. Although I do get the point that it was supposed to be a screenplay, it didn't come off that way at first to me just because it aesthetically doesn't look like a screenplay. It's not formatted as a screenplay. Um, so I thought it was a pretty cool idea to incorporate Grady's love of screenwriting by putting that, like, into the style of the way the book was written, but it could have been done better, like, it could have been done like an actual screenplay. A sophomore in high school that's really into screenwriting would probably know what a screenplay looks like. It, they wouldn't format it like that. It feels impersonal when Grady's supposedly writing these screenplays, but it's not done well. I want to believe that Grady's good at what he aspires to do, you know? Anyways, aside from those two picky things about goths and screenplays, um, it was not realistic. I never really enjoyed young adult books. Um, YA isn't just really my genre, but even in this genre, all of the romance seemed really rushed. Which I can get when you're in high school, everything can move really quickly, but I'm in high school too, and I have never known somebody to break up and then kiss somebody the same day that they kind of broke up with their boyfriend of like two years, I don't know. It just didn't seem very realistic to me, but I am definitely willing to kind of brush that one off because high school is tumultuous and I get that. I'm totally willing to pass off like the unrealistic romances, whatever, I don't really care about that. Um, it just did make, again, the book seem a bit less realistic and it's something I would have appreciated being maybe a bit more slow paced. The romance, of course, did add to the plot in the ways that it needed to, but it wasn't 
additive to the plot in a way that a friendship couldn't have been. Again, it's not something that turned me off the book completely, it's just something that I think could have been better. The dialogue was also extremely unrealistic, and I'm not talking about the dialogue in the screenwriting that Grady did in the book, um, I'm talking about the dialogue that the author wrote. Like, so much of it uses the characters' names over and over, and I don't remember the last time I had a conversation that was like, Hey Ashton, what's your favorite color? Hi Jack, my favorite color is blue. Okay Ashton, I also like blue. Well, you know, they use each other's names a lot. And and sure, maybe when you're reading a bit more slowly, it helps you remind yourself who's who, but at my pace of reading, it just seemed repetitive. Like, I know who's talking because of the way the text is formatted. And if you need to continuously include your characters' names in dialogue, then it's gonna confuse the reader more than it's gonna help them. In my opinion, at least. Um, it seemed clunky and unrealistic, and when that dialogue played out in my head, it just, it seemed that all the dialogue had a point to get the plot across, which I understand and I know that that is, in theory, the point of dialogue, but when it's so obvious that that's what its point is, and when it's so painstakingly formatted with the characters' names in, like, every other line, it just, it wasn't my thing dialogue-wise. I didn't like the dialogue in this book, um, really at all. Another criticism I have of the book from like a, just a book standpoint, a lot of the characters were really archetypal. You've got annoying lazy little brother, you've got like tiny geeky boy, you've got the popular mean girl. You know, I've seen all of those character arcs before and it's not anything refreshing or new. Of course in 2007 I'm sure the introduction of a transgender character was like totally refreshing in itself, um, but you know the characters just could have been better developed, they could have been less archetypal, they could have been more individualistic. But again, that is something I am kind of willing to brush off. So from a writing standpoint, you can probably tell that this isn't really my type of book. It wasn't my favorite thing to read, and I don't think it would have been my favorite to read when I was younger either. That being said, trans kids are kind of starved for representation, and when you find a book about yourself, especially when it was written so long ago, that must have been like life-changing for people, right? Um, and I wouldn't blame anybody for enjoying the book, even with its flaws in my opinion. Um, with the writing itself because of the content, and that's what we're going to talk about now. The trans stuff, what I know you're all here for. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to start with my likes to keep it positive because I know I criticize the writing style a lot. Literally on page three of the book it started off with something I really liked, and I'm going to read a bit of that to you in a moment. Um, but basically the main character Grady is talking about how the babies, they're born, and then somebody's like, look, it's a dick, it's a boy. And Grady's like, that's dumb, I don't understand, but why do we do that? And that's something that really resonated with me because um, as a part of like my trans experience, not understanding gendering children was a big part of that for me, um, and it was pretty cool to see that reflected in a book. And Grady's interior monologue says, For some reason, that is the first thing everybody wants to know the minute that you're born. Should we label it with pink or blue? Wouldn't want anyone to mistake the gender of an infant. Why is that so important? It's a baby. And why does it have to be a simple answer, one or the other? Not all of us fit so neatly into the category we get saddled with on day one, when the doctor glances down and makes a quick assessment of the available equipment. What's the big rush, anyway? I really liked the kind of anti-bioessentialism that it started off on. I thought it was definitely a good introduction um, to the trans experience for people that might have read this unsure about what being trans is. Quite a bit later in the book, when Grady's mom first started calling him by the name that he chose for himself, Grady kind of expressed not wanting to make a big deal out of it, but feeling incredibly validated and really, really happy with finally being called his proper name. And that, again, was an experience that I really, really related to. A lot of cis people don't realize how much it means when they do something as simple as gendering you correctly or calling you the name that you've chosen. It's just not always an experience that they can fully understand the fact that we go our entire lives fighting for the right to express ourselves the way we feel, and that being validated by another person, especially when they're cisgender, can feel so, so good. And I really liked that Whitlinger expressed that through, you know, having Grady be really happy about it, but also writing it in a way where it seemed like nobody else saw it as a big deal, right? I feel like it's a pretty common experience for cisgender people to not understand how impactful that their words can be. Um, so I really liked the way that this portrayed that in showing the kind of blissful ignorance of the cis folk while showing how happy just a simple thing like that could make a kid like Grady. And throughout the book, whenever Grady's gender is validated, whether the clerk at the store calls him sir or a teacher agrees to call him his new name, um, he expressed this feeling of like, 
pure euphoria that really, really resonated with me, and I feel like it was written in a way that a cis person can understand it too. So I did think those two things were really, really well done. Next I'm going to talk about a few things that I'm kind of unsure on. These were things that at first I either liked or really disliked, but then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, mm, I could go either way. So the first one is that I definitely would have appreciated more exposition, and this could fall a little bit into my earlier category of like writing style things that I wasn't particularly fond of, but this was more translated for me because it kind of just jumped into Grady being trans. Immediately on the first page, he's he knows that he's a boy. And on one hand, I like that because I did enjoy seeing the character not struggling with their identity, but struggling with getting others to understand it. I feel like it could definitely clear up the misconception that a lot of cis people have, that trans people are confused, when in reality we are often very very sure about our genders and it's the cisgender people that are confused. Personally, I would have liked a little bit more in the beginning, maybe giving the reader some context, especially for somebody that might have picked this up and not known what a trans person is in the first place, unlike me. The very like quick, snappy to the point exposition definitely worked for me, but I know that for others it may not be as like clear what's going on. But then again, some people do enjoy a book where they can kind of go all in right off the bat without any, you know, build up. So I could see it going either way, but it is something that I just wasn't sure about. Another thing was, without any spoilers, Grady ends up cutting off a transphobic friend. And at first, I really love that. It's really empowering to see a character being strong enough to say, you know, you're not good for me, you're being a transphobe, and I can't be your friend anymore because if you don't support who I am, we, we just can't be friends. It was good to see that. But later, the friend, like, did something that was, you know, a nice thing to do for Grady, but for me, it didn't redeem that character. That redemption arc just came up way too quick. Although I understood why Grady did forgive this character and want to be their friend again, just for me, it sat wrong. It kind of gave the impression that transphobia can be excused if a single nice act is done, which I don't think is really the case. So I did like that Grady at first cut off transphobic friends, but it kind of bothered me a little bit when he let that transphobic friend back into his life so easily. Um, but that could just be me. Maybe I'm really harsh. I don't know. <laughs> the other thing that I was kind of neither here nor there about was a joke that a cisgender friend made around page 100. One of Grady's cis friends made the joke when he passed at a convenience store like, oh, she called you sir, you're a real boy now. And while I get that that's a joke, um, a reader that isn't trans might not get that that's a joke. Maybe I'm underestimating cis people, but I could definitely see a cis person reading that and being like, that's a good thing to, you know, tell my trans friend about. It's because, well, yes, passing is super duper validating. It's not a good thing to focus your life around that goal, and it's definitely not a good thing to pressure your trans friend to focus their life around that goal. It's not a good thing to associate being a real boy with passing as a cis boy. And I know it was a joke. I'm being sensitive. I'm just reviewing the book, these are just my thoughts, I'm just one trans person. And the final thing that I was unsure on was how much the author used brave. Grady didn't even use brave to describe himself, but everybody around him called him brave. Everybody that was accepting called him brave, brave boy, you're so brave for talking about this, you're so brave for knowing who you are, and this is something I could do a whole video on, the whole you're so brave thing. I feel like a lot of you will understand what I'm getting at. Um, I feel like the majority of you are at least trans allies, if not trans. Um, calling a trans person brave is just kind of belittling almost. Well, it absolutely can take courage to come out and be yourself in a society that disapproves of who you are. It's kind of a big cliche in the trans community to, to you know, tell people, oh, you're so brave for being yourself. Um, so that wasn't something that I particularly liked, but again, this was written like 12 years ago, so I can kind of give it a pass on that. If there was just a lot of repetition of Grady being brave and, you know, courageous and so resilient, and, well, to an extent I understand that, especially because this was written in 2005, it's just kind of cliched at this point and kind of tired. Now to be a downer, um, a few things that I really didn't like. Um, my main kind of qualm with the book as a whole was Ace Bandages. You probably know where I'm going with this. Grady, for the majority of the book, used Ace Bandages to bind, and they did describe the Ace Bandages as painful, um, but they didn't quite get across how frickin' dangerous it is to bind your chest with ace bandages. Like, genuinely, it can be life-threatening. You can bruise ribs, you can crack ribs, you can puncture your lung. Like, it's it's very, very dangerous to bind with an ace bandage, and I would have at least appreciated a disclaimer about that. Like, hey, if you're reading this, don't bind with an ace bandage if you're considering it, hey. Um, but 
no, they just kind of portrayed it as normal, which I understand that it is a pretty common occurrence in the trans masculine community, but that doesn't mean it's safe. It's dangerous, and I really didn't like that the book kind of, not promoted, but portrayed that so many times in a positive light where Grady was like, ah, yes, my ace bandage, making my chest look flat. I was like, ooh, ooh, yikes. I don't know if as much information was out there about that in 2005 when this was written, but it's just something that, again, rubbed me the wrong way and kind of made me a bit wary to recommend this book to younger trans people. Another thing that I didn't like that was super cliche was on page nine, um, Grady kind of did the whole inside my girl body is a boy soul thing. Inside the body of this strange, never quite right girl hid the soul of a typical average ordinary boy. Yeah. Which again is something that's like, I get it, it's a common trope when the media is portraying trans people, but it's tired. And I know this is an old book and I do want to give it a pass for that, but it's still something that is like, you could have described that better, this could have been better, you didn't have to call it a girl body. I don't have any breast tissue anymore, my voice is relatively deep, I have hair on my tummy and on my legs, um, but even before that, when I had a chest, when my voice was really high, when I had long hair, when I identified as a boy, my body was a boy body. You know, it doesn't matter how it looks to other people. If you identify as a boy, your body's a boy body. If you identify as a girl, your body is a girl body, regardless if it has a dick or not. Like, that's something that I will always, like, very, very strongly believe, so it put me off a bit. Another thing that I definitely didn't like was Grady's main ally among the teachers was a gym teacher, which is fine. That's not the thing I didn't like. But when Grady came out to his gym teacher, um, one of the first things the gym teacher was said was, mm, yeah, you're not the first. Like, a few years ago, there was somebody, a boy, going the other way. Uh, she was trying to describe a trans woman, <laughs> but she said, like, a boy, as in this, you know, is a boy that thinks it's a girl, that type of cliche, um, going the other way as if being trans is some journey. Like, okay, sure, it's a journey, metaphorically, whatever. But <laughs> it just made me think of, like, you know, a boy, like, walking towards being a woman, and that's just not entirely how it works. And I understand that being the easy explanation for cisgender people, but you got as many pages as you want in this young adult book, okay? You could expand on this however you want, and you choose to say a boy going the other way. I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I don't know about that one. Like, finally, I just kind of wanted to talk about some out-of-place uh, miscellaneous things that I noticed about the book. One, that there were resources in the back. I did appreciate that. I think a better format would have been resources in the front, but that's probably more of a personal preference. I just would have liked people to know, like, basic background stuff before reading the book, as opposed to picking up all these cliches that I've talked about before actually reading about trans people. She included a book um, called Beyond Magenta that I want to review soon that highlights non-binary people a lot, which I definitely appreciated. The book being about what is presumably a binary trans man, um, I did like that she included a book that does discuss non-binary identities. And she also put in a lot of resources that are websites where you can go to get support, which I also appreciated. So Ellen Whitlinger wrote an essay on Parrotfish 10 years after she wrote it in 2015. In Parrotfish and in an interview that Ellen did ages ago about the book, um, she used the word transgendered, which puts me off for sure. So I was really glad that she addressed it in this essay and pointed out why it's not correct and the fact that she's learned from that, um, I really did like that. That definitely made me a lot more comfortable with reviewing this book, because at first when I read Transgendered in there, I was like, oh god, here we go. <laughs> but she clarified it in this more recent essay, and she did address that, like, I recognize that that wording is not accurate, and I shouldn't have used it, and I was like, okay, thank you. But anyways, I'm gonna link the article that Ellen wrote in 2015 in the description. It's a pretty good read, um, maybe even before you read the book, if you do decide to do so. She justified a few of the choices she made, and it made me more comfortable with the book as a whole, like, knowing where she came from. But I think that is the bulk of what I wanted to say about Parrotfish and about my reading of it as a trans person. Researching for the book review videos that I apparently do now, um, one of the things that I always look for is other people's reviews to kind of see, like, what other people's criticisms criticisms are, if I agree with them. Um, I don't like plagiarize or anything, but I like knowing what other people are thinking about a book. And something that bothered me a lot in a surprising majority of the reviews was using not only Grady's birth name, but she, her for Grady. But reading the reviews that used she, her for Grady, like, through the whole review, kind of made me not only uncomfortable, but question the book a little bit, in that, like, if somebody read this book and took the time to write a review and still didn't understand that you shouldn't use she, her for a trans man, 
I don't know. Uh, I don't know how effective the book is then, you know? But, but I actually think those are all my thoughts on Parrotfish. It was definitely interesting to read a book about a trans person that a cisgender person wrote, because there were definitely some little things that I noticed and I talked about in this video that I don't think a trans person would have written. I definitely want to keep doing these kind of trans related book reviews, so let me know if you do like them. Um, I have so many trans related books that I own, so I kind of want to get through at least the majority of those before I buy other trans related books. Um, but I do have the Magenta one that I mentioned earlier. I have the Teasler one by Laura Jane Grace that I definitely want to review. I have Transmission by Alex Birdie. Um, let me know if any of those are particularly of interest to you guys, and I will hopefully review one of them in the near future. Um, I know this was pretty critical, but I tend to be pretty critical when I'm nitpicking how a cisgender person talks about trans people. The way that I read this book, it kind of seemed like the author was stepping on eggshells, but like not being careful, you know? <laughs> Does that make any sense? But for its time, I think this was a really, really well done book and would have been really nice to read in 2007. Nowadays though, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think I would want to give this book to a cisgender kid to have them learn about trans people because of the cliches that I mentioned before of Grady being a boy in a girl's body or being so brave and stuff like that. I think my main qualm with having a younger trans kid read this book would be that there are just better books. You know, I think if you're going to read a book about trans people, make it one written by a trans person. And I get that Ellen did have help from Toby, but there are better books. There are better books out there. I think that is my main review. It's not bad. Um, if you are somebody that already understands transgender people, then I don't think it's a bad read if you like young adult fiction, but it is very cliched. A lot of the characters are pretty archetypal, um, and the writing style wasn't anything particularly unique or interesting. So I have gotten through my notes, finally. That's all I have to say right now about this book. If any of you have read it or want to read it, please feel free to discuss it with me in the comments. I love talking about books. We had some really awesome conversations on the last um, trans book review, so I hope that you guys like this one as well. Bears can come up and say goodbye. Goodbye. I hope you have a fantastic day and I hope that you feel really affirmed in your gender. And if not, I hope that you can find a piece of media that you see yourself in and I will talk to you later, maybe.